Hello, today I am going to discuss about a new application of lasers. Uh, this is an extremely large area of interest. This is nonlinear optics. It is the intensity of light that now starts affecting uh, the response from the physical system. So let us take it step by step. Let me start with uh, first the Maxwell's equations in a neutral dielectric medium. So that first we will construct the wave equation and we clearly see and we will derive a situation where we clearly see that the, the nonlinear polarization acts like a source and hence one can now solve the, the wave equation with a nonlinear source term and see what are the consequences of it. So let me write down the Maxwell's equations in neutral uh, dielectric media. So I'm looking at uh, situations where there is uh, no, uh, no free charge or uh, free currents. So essentially what I'm talking about is basically a neutral dielectric media. So let me write down the equations. The first equation is del dot d equal to zero. The second equation is del dot b equal to zero. So this is the first one is the Gauss's law in the generalized sense because now you are looking at material medium. Uh, the third equation is the Faraday's law where del cross E is minus dou B by dou T and then you have the last the Ampere's law which is telling you del cross H is dou d by dou t. There are no free charges or free currents in our problem. So they come with the two constituent relations which basically relates a b to h. So b in general is mu naught h plus n and uh, d which is the displacement vector is related to epsilon naught e plus polarization b. So let me now look at these parameters. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. Electric electric permittivity of free space whereas mu naught is the magnetic permeability of free space. Magnetization is basically the dipole magnetic dipole moments per unit volume. Similarly polarization is electric dipole moments per unit volume. So we are now looking at a frequency range so omega range is roughly optical, right? That would mean that my frequency corresponds to about 10 to the power of 14 hertz. Now you see that in this frequency range, there is no naturally occurring magnetic response. Most magnetic response is largely confined to omegas less than about 10 to the power of 9 or gigahertz. So you see that my in that situation my magnetization m is 0 and hence I have got b is simply mu naught times h. So this is true at optical frequencies. So from here 
now we we want to get to the wave equation so what one does is to basically look at these last two equations the faraday's law and the ampere's law take a curl of it on both sides and go ahead so let us do that so let's take the faraday's law and take the curl this is just for the derivation of the wave equation this is my left hand side and similarly there is a minus sign and now I am taking del cross dou b by dou t correct now you see that the this the space and time can be interchanged because they are quite independent of each other so I have minus dou by dou t of del cross b now this can be written down as uh, so minus there is a dou by dou t and in the bracket I would get mu naught times dou t by dou t. So that gives me a right hand side which is the second derivative. in time of dou 2 d by dou t square. So now if you look at the, the left hand side, one can basically use uh, the vector algebra to open this up and you see that that del cross del cross operating on E can be written as the gradient of the divergence of E minus the Laplacian del square acting on E. Now you see uh, in this I make another assumption which is I am looking at transverse fields. What that means is I am basically going to focus on fields that are propagating uh, and I am looking at essentially homogeneous medium. So what you have is the electric field vector being perpendicular to the, the k vector, right? So if you look at the plane wave basis, you can clearly see that the del dot E will bring down, a, this will be equal to a k dot E and because these are perpendicular, you will see that this implies that my del dot E is actually zero. Right. So given that, what I get quickly is the wave equation, which is the following. My del square E equals mu naught dou square D by dou T square. So I use the constant relations between D and P and get to now this equation which is I'm just substituting for D and what I get is right so the material response is now captured in this polarization the macroscopic measure of the collection of dipole moments is basically the polarization so hence what we get is the following I have del square E minus 1 over c square dou square e over dou t square this is when I am taking this first term to the left hand side and on the right hand side I continue with mu naught dou square p over dou t square. Recall I have used the fact that c square is square root is basically 1 over epsilon naught mu naught. All right. So you see now this is what is my wave equation. So on if I set my right hand side to 0, this would mean there is no medium and one would have the possibility of waves which are traveling 
self consistently and that what that's what gives you the freely propagating electromagnetic waves now the in the simplest scenario what you have is a linear medium so let me look at now the linear medium so in the linear medium what i have is my response p is now governed by a constant called susceptibility and it's directly related to the electric field this is a linear response so where p is now the the response where e is the stimulus so if i plot e versus e versus p what i get is some sort of a straight line right that is if i now it's a linear relationship in the sense that if i double e if i make e two times my p will become twice as much right so that's a linear response so let's put this linear response and check out what we get so what i get now if i put this p back into the above wave equation i get del square e minus 1 over c square dou square e over dou t square and mu naught epsilon naught times chi 1 which is the linear response times dou square e over dou t square so i can essentially uh, combine these two terms and what i get for example is the usual So there you go. So you see that now what has happened in such a linear medium is that my, my velocity of the wave is no longer the velocity associated with free space, but it is given by a scale velocity. So my, the velocity inside the medium is given by V, which is C by square root of 1 plus uh, chi right so uh, clearly this this square root is what we call as the refractive index so let us just list out the few things that we know about linear response yeah, so the refractive index N has got a real and an imaginary part. We have discussed a few lectures ago uh, how these two quantities behave as a function of frequency. So that is uh, the dispersive response. So in linear optic, the refractive index that is the N real as well as you know the N imaginary in linear optics, both of these are independent of intensity. The second aspect is, of course, because we are in linear regime, superposition, the principle of superposition holds. The third point is that the, the frequency of light uh, remains unaltered. And the fourth important issue is that uh, different light beams do not interact. This is, uh, as you can see, is common experience. Let's say you put in a red light and a yellow light within any linear medium. They will just pass right by without affecting each other. So basically, you cannot use light to control light. Now, the, so what happens in nonlinear optics, you know, is that all these 
all these above four um, above four points that I have listed here, almost everything is um, altered. And there are very interesting ways in which this happens. Uh, it's very fascinating. It's very novel. Uh, one would think of it as non-intuitive. But then once you get the hang of it, you realize it's, it's a whole uh, different world that got switched on with the invention of the laser. So it is this business of nonlinear response, you know, that is what we are going to uh, deal with uh, in some detail as we uh, go along.